Thank you, Brother William. I have lit the Christ candle this morning here. Perhaps you have also lit the Christ candles in your own homes. Um, Christ draws us together, is the light of the world, is the light of our lives in the midst of all of the darkness. Hear God's greeting this morning. Grace and mercy and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the sevenfold spirit which is before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And all God's people said, Amen. This time, Jen will call us to worship. Morning. In a minute, we'll be listening and maybe singing along and watching Catherine um, sing Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. And as I was thinking about the lyrics of that song, I remembered um, the words of Psalm 139. So I wanted to read that this morning. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are one, you are, <laughs> I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You works are wonderful. Even when we mess up our words. I know that full well that we were made to praise God. So let's do that through this song. Let's pray together our prayer of confession. The children's message will come next after this, so just switching the order around a little bit. Let's pray. O oh, love that will not let us go, we rest our weary souls in thee. God, we are weary, we are fatigued, our resilience is lacking, and we realize once again this morning how much we have been trying 
to do in our own strength. How much we have been trying to live by the light of our own flickering torches. God, we confess our over-dependence on ourselves, our commitment to self-reliance. We confess our pride that keeps us from reaching out to others and to you. Because our pride and our sin is certainly a part of our weariness right now. But God, these sins are not the whole story. There is more to our fatigue than our failure to rely on you. God, we leave a space this morning to gather up our sadness and our lament for all that is not right in the world and in our world. We sit in silence for a moment to feel the feels of the sadness and lament. God, sometimes it feels like we are laying in the dust with life's glory dead as we just sang. But from the ground, there blossoms red, life that shall endless be. Jesus, because of your death and the blood that you shed for us that fell to the ground, New life has blossomed. Our forgiveness has blossomed. Our resurrection has blossomed. Endless life is ours because of you, and we thank you this morning. We thank you for being the place where we can rest from the weariness of our sins, where we can rest from the weariness of the things that happen over which we have no control. God, be our rest this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance this morning are from Hebrews chapter 13, where it says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Turn it over to Catherine um, via video for our children's message this morning. Hi, West Side Kids. We've been talking a lot about remembering lately, haven't we? We've talked about how God remembers us, how he knows us. Um, we've talked about how we remember God and the things that, uh, that he has done for us and, and who he is. And today I want to talk about another kind of remembering that's also very important. And it's about remembering yourself. Now that may seem like a funny thing because if we think about forgetting things, uh, it might seem like how could we forget our own self? Um, it's not the same thing as maybe um, forgetting that it was your friend's birthday, for example, or forgetting uh, your wallet at the grocery store after you've gone all the way through the line. I don't know if any of your parents have ever done that before, but I certainly have, and it is not fun. But you don't get somewhere and say, oh, I forgot myself, because you're always with you. So what does that mean when we say we need to remember ourselves? Um, but I think there are ways that we can forget who we are, aren't there? And that reminds me of a movie that you might have seen that's called The Lion King. And in The Lion King, uh, Simba has forgotten himself. And then he has this vision of his father who had died, and his father is speaking to him, and his father says, <laughs> was Mufasa, the king, speaking to Simba and reminding Simba of who he is. He had forgotten that he was the son of the king. And it's interesting to me that Mufasa didn't say, 
remember what you have to do. He, he, he said, remember who you are. And I think when we remember also that we are children of the king, then that changes, it changes how we see ourselves, it changes how we see others, and it ends up changing the things that we do, doesn't it? And in The Lion King, Simba goes on when he remembers who he is, and he remembers that he was the child of the king, um, and that gives him the courage that he needed to save the kingdom. And for us, when we remember that we were made in the image of God, that we are children of God, and we can see that image in the people around us, then that can change us too, and it can change what we do. And it can help us to have more courage, just like Simba. It can help us to have more compassion towards others and towards ourself. And, uh, and it helps us understand our relationship with God a bit later, a bit better, because he always says, doesn't he, that he's our father, he is our parent, and that's a very special relationship. And so my hope for you this week is that you will remember who you are as a child of the King. Sorry about that. I'm different phone, didn't know where the mute button was. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you that we can be together today to read and hear your word, hear a message from Pastor Heidi. Be with her as she preaches. Give her wisdom and strength and your words, Lord. And just be with this reading and with this day. In your name I pray. Amen. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds of the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on the flat fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every human being, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by human shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sister Carol. And by the way, just announcing that Sister Carol has been brought into our family bubble. So now you know why it's always sitting next to Carol and why we're not quite as distant from each other. So um, there's that. Genesis 9, 1 to 7. All right, so last week, we looked at the end of Genesis chapter 8. And we left that chapter with God speaking to himself. He was speaking in his heart. So in the same place where God had felt pain in his heart because of all the evil that humankind was doing all the time, God spoke in his heart a commitment to never, ever, ever again destroy the whole world with a flood and a commitment to provide for all that the world needed. Well, there's one thing, it's one thing to speak in your heart, to speak in your mind, to speak to yourself, and it's another thing to speak to others, as we know, right? So every Sunday morning, I rehearse my sermon on my walk with Nevada, and she doesn't care what's going on. So basically, I'm speaking to myself, and 
whoever else I happened to be walking by. I kind of stopped, stopped talking to myself as I walked by someone else. Um, but yeah, there's one thing about speaking to yourself or your dog or speaking in your heart. And another thing it is to, to speak these things out loud. So God had preached a, a great sermon in his heart, but now he is speaking to Noah. He is speaking to Noah. And it says that God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now, as soon as we hear these words, we should have echoes going in. This is an echo. This, these words have already been used in scripture. They have been used just the chapter before, just the chapter before in chapter eight, when uh, Noah came out of the ark, God told Noah to bring the animals out of the ark. And then he said of the animals, bring out every kind of living creature so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So God gave the same kind of mandate and, and, and call to the animals that he is now giving to Noah. But wait, there is an even earlier original sounding out of these words that, that the words in chapters eight and nine are an echo of. We go all the way back, all the way back, just a few chapters to Genesis chapter one, to the very first pages and the first words of scripture, where God says to humans that they are to be fruitful. This is Genesis one, chapter uh, one, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So you hear this, right? You hear this echo throughout these first chapters of Genesis. And this reiterates to us that we've got a new creation going on here. We have a new creation. Noah, who is a farmer, and in the Hebrew name for farmer is the word Adam. Noah is like the new Adam on this earth and his family. And, and so we hear this echo, this echo of the command that God gave Noah and his family now to, to be fruitful and increase in number. But there are some really strong differences between God's blessing and mandate in Genesis 1 to Adam and Eve, to the first humans, and God's blessing and mandate in Genesis 9. One of those is this. In Genesis 1, when God made the animals, God did tell humans that they would rule over the animals, but what did that rule look like? If you turn the page to Genesis chapter 2, we read that God brought all of the animals to Adam to have him name them. And of course, no suitable partner was found among the animals to be a partner to Adam. But you get the sense that Adam made some pretty good friends with those animals. And so, so in a sense, in Genesis 1, that, that rule of ruling the, the creatures of the earth was a rule of love and, and almost a, a partnership. In Genesis 9, it looks a little different. What did Carol read in Genesis 9? Be fruitful and increase the number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and every creature that moves along the ground. Fear and dread are now part of the relationship between humans and animals. In Genesis 1, humans and animals were both given the gift of plants for food. So the food that the humans ate was the same as the, the food that the animals ate. They ate plants. But now, right, in Genesis 9, God also gave to humans animals to eat. So no wonder the fear and dread of, of humans was descending upon uh, the creatures because they knew that they could be eaten by them. I would also be afraid and full of dread if I knew that I could be eaten by those who were ruling over me. And so there is a different world. It is a recreation, but it's a different world than the world that they came from. So there are some strong differences between Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. But in the giving of 
the flesh of animals to humans to eat, there was a boundary drawn. I like to think of it this way. I like to think of God's blessing as, as the main overall arch in this, in this text. And within that blessing is a mandate and a calling that God gave to Noah and his family to be fruitful and increase in number. And within that mandate is the provision that God gave them of food to eat. Now he says, I give you everything. And within that provision, there is a boundary. Just because I give you everything doesn't mean that you can treat everything just any way you wish. God said that they must not eat the flesh of animals. They must not eat meat with the life blood still in it. Hmm. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we can't have a steak rare? <laughs> is that what is being said? Well, I'm not sure that that's the main takeaway from this text. In Leviticus chapter 17, it says that the life of the creature is in the blood. For some reason, the blood of the creature, eating, eating meat with the blood still in it, went against the grain of God's provision of, of animals to eat. And what this says to me, it probably it could say a lot of different things, but what this says to me is that there is a preciousness about the life of animals as well, and that their lives should not be taken for any reason or for food, just um, lightly or thoughtlessly. Animal life is precious life too. They are part of God's creation. My goodness, they were given the mandate to be fruitful and increase in number back in Genesis chapter 8. And there are all sorts of interesting places in scripture that show that animals are an important part of God's beautiful creation and God cares about animals. So when y'all have pets who die and your hearts break, this is right and good because animals are a good part of God's creation. One of the most interesting places that we find this is in the book of Jonah. So Jonah, if you remember that story, some of you might not know it. So it's the story of this prophet who is told to go to the huge city of Nineveh and to tell them that they need to repent and turn around from their sins. Jonah avoids this call, ends up spending some time in the belly of a big fish, eventually gets spit out of the fish's mouth. The fish spoke mostly, I guess, onto the land. And then Jonah decides to go to Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh. He tells them to repent. The whole city repents and turns around from their sin. And then Jonah gets cranky. He gets cranky because Nineveh had done exactly what God had hoped Nineveh would do. And uh, Jonah was kind of more excited about the fire and brimstone that he thought would come and was a bit grumpy about God's grace and God's provision. And in the very end, God said, he said this. I'm going to make sure I get the quote exactly right. This is the very last book or the very last verse of the book of, of Jonah. He said, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people and also many animals? God cares for humans and God cares for animals as well. Yes, he has given them as a provision of food to eat and God cares for them. I think about our friend Anagate. Those of you who've worshipped at Westside for a long time might remember Anagate. He's a friend of our congregation. He's the Métis man. Um, grew up a lot in the bush and sometimes goes to the bush and goes hunting, spends time in the woods. And when he talks about taking the life of a creature, he's very reverent about it. He talks about how he thanks the creature for their life and thanks God for the life of that creature. And then he uses all that that creature has to offer, not just the meat, but the fur, and every piece that he can for, for food, for clothing, for craft. And there's a holistic appreciation for the gift and the provision of that animal. The life of the creature is in the blood. There is something about all life that should be accounted for. It should not be taken lightly. Or thoughtlessly. And of course, this is the case for humans as well. The lifeblood 
of humans is so important. A couple of us at Westside have gotten to know that pretty uh, intensely in the last couple of weeks. For me, I, I've been inspired by all the Westside guys, especially who give blood together. Um, and so finally this year I said, I got to start giving blood again. So I've given blood a couple of times. This past Saturday, two Saturdays ago, I gave blood. Oh my goodness. I, useless the rest of the day. I could hardly move. I could, I was, was just really no good <laughs> of a mother or a wife in that day. Um, and, and it struck me, the life of the creature is in the blood. There's something about the blood that gives us vitality and life. And then I also asked Leo Yonker if I could share a story about what's going on for him. So Leo has a virus right now that about 80% of humans actually have. And for most of us, it is not a dangerous virus to have. And some people have actually developed antibodies in their blood that work against this virus. But it's not a big deal if you haven't had a kidney transplant. But Leo's had a kidney transplant, and so this virus poses a bit of a threat to him. And so he's being treated for this virus, and the treatment that he's received a couple of different times now is a blood serum that is made up of parts of blood for, of, of up to 1,000 people. It just blows my mind. With the hope and the prayer that there are antibodies in the, the, this combination blood that will help to fight the virus in Leo's blood. What a gift. The life of the creature is in the blood. And Leo, we pray that this blood would give you life and life abundant. So our blood is important. The blood of humans is important. And in fact, from, from the very first, we knew that, that God cared about the blood of his creatures. You might remember the first murder that happened in scripture. Cain and Abel, Cain, the brother who murdered his brother Abel. And the Lord said in Genesis chapter four, the blood of Abel, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. The blood of humans, God demands an accounting for that. All of our blood counts and matters. Each person counts and matters. Last year, feels like really recent, but I think it was last year already, I preached a sermon about um, how God counts each of us, right? In the Old Testament, when it says that the kings take a census of the people, sometimes the original Hebrew is that they lift up the heads of the people. And when I was in Israel, our rabbi George, when he was counting us one day, came up to each of us, took our face in his hands, and said, not our name, but a number, one, two, three. He lifted up our heads. He counted us. He count, accounted for us. And, and so I, I did that in the sanctuary that day. Maybe some of you had your face in my hands. We had a super awkward moment while I counted you out loud. But the point of that was to say that each person matters and counts. And God in Genesis 9 talks about, and in a bit of a sad way, look, if, if your hand causes the death of another from your hand, I, I demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Every person counts. Every person, it says, is made in the image of God. For in the image of God has God made mankind. We are all made in God's image. Every single person. I couldn't help but share something I saw this week that just, it just gutted me because even within our Christian circles and communities and the history of Christianity, there is so much evidence that we have not, that we have not treated every person as made in the image of God. Some of our earliest church theologians for whom we have a lot of respect have also said pretty horrible things about women particularly. I just had a few quotes that I ran across this week. One was from Augustine. Augustine, who, who said, St. Augustine, who said, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. St. Augustine, who gave us the confession. St. Augustine, who gave us the city of God. So many beautiful, full, 
theologically rich, deep text, also said that woman is not the image of God. But as, for, as far as man is concerned, he is by himself the image of God. And Martin Luther, who nailed the 95 Thesis on the, on the Wittenberg church door, who is responsible for, for so much reformation and good in the life of the church, also said this, the word and works of God is quite clear that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. Hmm, Martin, I'm gonna have some conversations with you. I think the Lord has probably already worked this out with him. Ah, and John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, whose brother Charles wrote hundreds of hymns, many of which we sang. John wrote a letter to his wife saying this, do not any longer contend for mastery, for power, money, or, or uh, praise. Be content to be private, insignificant person, known and loved by God and me. Of what importance is your character to mankind? If you were buried just now or if you had never lived, what, what loss would it be to the cause of God? And looking up John later, I learned that he was separated from his wife after only seven years of marriage, and I wonder why. I know that this is dated. There are cultural things that, that surround these, tech, these texts from these theologians, but there are current theologians and Christians as well who also might cut certain people out of the image of God, or at least bearing the fullness of the image of God. Brothers and sisters, every person is created in the image of God. Men and women, all genders, all sexual orientations, all colors, all ages, the young, the old, the very young still in the womb, the very old, so old and so at a loss of memory that they don't even know themselves. They have completely forgotten themselves and they are still known by God and created in the image of God. We are precious people. Our blood is precious to God. Now, if we, we haven't gotten heavy enough in this message, I, I just want to just get a little heavier with you. Genesis 9, verse 6, whoever sheds human blood by human shall their blood be shed. Now, some use this as a text that would justify the death penalty. Yep, I went there. And capital punishment. Now, we could have a long conversation about the arc of scripture and about why I would say that is not the takeaway that we should go away from scripture with based on this text. And at the same time, I want to sit with you. I want to sit with you for a moment in these words. Whoever sheds the blood of humans, by humans will their blood be shed. What just happened in Genesis chapter 6 and 7? The blood of every human being, aside from Noah and his family, was shed. Who shed the blood of every human being? It's pretty clear from scripture who sent the flood. God has shed blood. Whoever sheds the blood of human beings, by human beings will their blood be shed. Because God is beyond time and all-knowing, God knew in this very moment that thousands of years from then, the time would come when God would put a stop to all of the revenge and all of the bloodshed not by letting humans just kill and kill and kill and keep taking account by keeping on taking the life of the one who took the life of the one who took the life of the one who took the life, but no. God would enter time himself as Jesus Christ, would enter time himself as Jesus Christ and his blood would be shed by the hands of humans. Revenge and the shedding of blood by humans was not 
ever going to solve the problem of the inclination of evil in everyone's hearts. The only thing that would turn around the cycle of revenge and death upon death upon death upon death was God himself entering humanity and being, having his blood shed by the hands of humans. And from that point on, death itself began to work backwards. And it began the cycle of life that leads to life that leads to life, beginning with the resurrection, moving through Pentecost and the sending of the Spirit and the, the miracle of forgiveness and the miracle of everlasting life. Whoever sheds the blood of humans, by humans his blood was shed and his blood is now the eternal covenant with us that brings us everlasting life. Our text ends not with death. There's a lot of death and a lot of blood in this text, but with life. Genesis 9, verse 7. As for you, that's how it starts. Some translations say, but as for you, be fruitful and increase in number. All this bloodshed, all this talk of blood and demanding and accounting for blood, the turn happens and God concentrates on Noah and drives home the main point, keeping the main thing, the main thing. But as for you, this is my word to you. You, be fruitful, increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase on it. Our calling, our mandate is to be about life and to be about giving life in all the ways that we can and embracing life and grasping life and being for life in all the ways that we can. I'll never forget, my first husband, as many of you know, died in a car accident. It'll be 20 years this December. And a group of us, my friends and I, were gathered before the visitation fully started, friends and family were gathered next to Layton's casket. He wasn't there. And my friend Erica reached over to me. I imagine her grabbing my hand. I don't know if she did, but that's just the picture I have in my mind. She said, Heidi, you are alive. You are alive. Let's run a 25K. <laughs> and so from that, a dream was born in me that day. Um, you know what? We did run a 25K. In fact, I ran that 25K with Erica and Tim, with whom I fell in love while training for it. And we were fruitful and increased in number. And we celebrate our 18 year anniversary today. Yes. But even if that hadn't happened, it's that moment. Yes, Leighton's body is laid out cold. Yes, you are going to cry harder than you've ever cried, longer than you've ever cried. This is going to be really, really hard. There is death. And you are alive. Let's run. Friends, you might feel so exhausted and fatigued from COVID, from the craziness, from the exhaustion of working from home and parenting, from the exhaustion of the sheer loneliness you felt, by not being able to touch and be with the people you want to be with. The exhaustion of losing a job. I know there's some of you who've had that story, that situation. You are laying in dust, life's glory, dead. But from the ground, there blossoms red. Life, life. That shall endless be. You are alive. You have made it this far, not on your own strength, but because God is with you and he is for you and he is for your life. Thanks be to God for his promises. Thanks be to God for you. I wish I could look at all of you. I'm looking at you, Jen. You're the last voice on my screen, so I'm looking at you today. But I would love to be able to look into your faces, maybe even touch your faces and say, you are counted, you matter, your life matters. Let's run, let's go.
Yes, Bev says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, the fatigue is real. The weariness is real. The death is real. Most of us don't know people who have died from COVID, but a lot of people do know. Death is real in Beirut. Death is real in places that have been become more impoverished and, and famine and, and poverty and loss are just so huge. God, it's real. Turn to each of us. Look into our faces and say, as for you, as for you, as for you, be fruitful. Live your life. God, we cannot do this in our own strength. We need your blessing. We need your call. We need your provision. We need your boundary lines to help us to do life well. And we trust that you, as you gave this to Noah, will bless us, will call us, will provide for us, and will give us the boundaries we need to live life with you and for you. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together. I will be there.
you, Brother Leo. This time, um, we are going to be closing our service in a number of ways. I first want to let you know that the transition team and the council have been putting in a lot of work, building in grounds, worship, to start reimagining what worship will look like for us. Um, we have a tentative opening date of September 20. That's, that's when we hope to reopen the sanctuary, though of course worship has continued all through this time. And work is being done to make that happen. You'll be receiving a video sometime in the next week and a half or so to, uh, show you what it's going to be like when you come back to the sanctuary and we hope to also have a town hall on august the 23rd um, after church at one o'clock in the afternoon just to talk through the changes answer any questions you might have and get a sense from you how you're doing as you anticipate returning in, to worshiping in the in the sanctuary for those who will um, and i also want to invite you to the breakout rooms after the service today um, you know, again, don't feel like you have to stay for long. Just a few minutes to connect with a few more people is such a blessing to, to have that conversation. So Tim uh, will put us into breakout rooms after the service. And then forgiving today. We give, we just have our one cause of Westside Ministries today. So, um, and I know some of you have probably given through World Renew to Beirut, um, probably on your own this week. So we just encourage you to continue to give generously to the causes that you uh, are most concerned about and that the Lord calls you to. Um, we trust that you are doing that, but you can give online to Westside. You can do that through the website or through the bridge app or dropping off a check at church. Eventually when we're back in the sanctuary together, there'll be a box to drop in your check. So there are so many ways to give and we trust that um, you will give generously from your heart. And so those are all my concluding announcements today. And I, also, as I hold this light, I am particularly mindful of the fact that next week, Sunday, Carol Hewlin, our intern, who has been such a wonderful assistant and friend throughout this time and a good pastor in training to us, she will be preaching her first message on Psalm 27 that talks all about light. So as I change this light today, our prayers are going to go with Carol as she prepares to preach next week, Sunday, but our prayers go with all of you as you take the Christ light with, Christ light with you wherever you go. Receive God's blessing Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. We'll sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above He heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Go in peace or stay in peace for a while to love and serve the Lord, brothers and sisters. <laughs>